thanks everybody for joining us potentially very early or potentially perfectly in the middle of the afternoon um, for our Network Canvas workshop, um, Connecting Personal Networks Research with Network Canvas. And we wish we could be there physically with you, but um, this is the next best thing. Um, so today, just to go over what we're gonna be covering today, um, you know, our general purpose is we are going to be doing a three hour condensed, usually we do a little bit longer than this, but um, this is probably a little bit best for this format with Zoom. Um, three hour experience in order to provide a comprehensive introduction um, to the topics covered. We want you guys at the end of this to be able to understand some of the underlying principles of Network Canvas. Um, so you can implement your own measures and your techniques and techniques within a Network Canvas interview. Uh, we want you to be able to deploy interviews and to obtain network data. We want you to be able to export data for use in your favorite uh, data analytic tools. Um, and we want you all to be able to get some hands-on assistance from us. So Q&A questions, if you're a little bit further along, if you have more advanced questions, we would love to field those too. Um, yeah, and just also just get to know our team a little bit. Um, we have a couple of different prerequisites. Um, I believe Kate is sharing this potentially via email as well. We have a Google Drive that has a number of different things located there. Um, first of all, you should all have the software downloaded. So that's interview or an architect, especially. Um, we think that'll help you to follow along with what we're working on today. Um, there are two Network Canvas protocols also available within our Google Drive. Um, you might want to follow along with those as well. Um, you're also going to, um, we'll be going through some example script and data files, and those are located there as well. Just as a note, um, when uh, the zip file is, um, is uploaded to Google Drive, it's a little just confusing. You're just going to download the entire folder, and um, it'll come out exactly as a zip file, and then you'll be able to use it. Um, there's a tiny URL there, if that's easier for you for locating any of those materials. Um, if you have any questions, um, please use our Zoom chat. Um, you know, if you need anything, just let us know and somebody in our team will be able to assist you. Um, and if we can't figure it out in our chat, we can put you in a room um, with one of our team members. In particular, I would love it if you could um, PM Hala. Um, so maybe this is a really good time to just introduce our team. Um, so my name is Michelle Burkett. Um, I'm one of the project PIs. I'm an assistant professor in medical social sciences at Northwestern. Um, and I'll be just giving you a brief introduction today. Um, I next want to point it to Gregory Phillips, who's the other project PI. Gregory, do you want to do a quick introduction? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I am Gregory Phillips. I, like Michelle, am an assistant professor at Northwestern University in the Department of Medical Social Sciences, and I'm also one of the PIs of the project. I am an epidemiologist by training, but have done a ton of network work with this wonderful team. Thanks, Gregory. I'm next, I'm going to point it to Kate. Um, who is just very central to everything Network Canvas, and many of you have probably already messaged with Kate. Kate, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm Kate Banner. I work closely with um, this team at Northwestern University on Network Canvas and a bunch of projects that are implementing Network Canvas in the field. Um, so yeah, I probably had the pleasure of communicating with a number of you over email. Um, if anything comes up during the workshop today, I'm on hand. So um, feel free to send me a direct message um, either in the chat or by email is fine as well. Thanks, Kate. And then next I want to allow Hala to introduce themselves. Hi, good morning. I'm Hala Buckholt and I'm a data assistant at Connect uh, working with these folks um, on this project and feel free to message me about any um, tech issues or anything else you need sorted out. Later today, thanks so much, Hala. And later today, you'll hear more um, from Bernie, from Pat, from Josh, also core members of our team, and I'll let them introduce themselves before their sections. Um, cool. So 
Um, and again, just as I said before, we will be recording today. Um, if you have any concerns about that, just let us know. Um, but again, the, the point of this is not to share you or your questions. It's really just to share the lecture content of what we're doing today. So let me just give you a brief overview of what we're gonna be going over in our three hours together. So I'm gonna be doing a brief workshop orientation um, just giving you um, some understanding of both of the workshop and then also some of the core principles behind Network Canvas. Um, and then Josh is going to be taking over and is going to be introducing interviewer. Um, and then Bernie will be doing um, an introducing of architect. And then we'll be talking through making an effective Network Canvas protocol. We'll be doing a 15 minute break to give all of us just a little brief rest from Zoom. And then we will be talking about um, using Network Canvas data and data export led by Pat. And then at the very end, we'll be doing some Q&A questions. Don't feel like you need to save questions for the end, but certainly, you know, if you have some, you know, any kind of scenarios or things that are particular for your project, maybe that's a good time to bring it up. Any questions so far? Cool. Okay. So quick introduction to the project. Um, so Network Canvas is a software suite that's comprised of three different apps, architect, server, and interviewer. Some of this might be review for people who watched the video, but um, so architect is an app that is really meant to build Network Canvas interviews, okay? It's something that is primarily engaged with by the researcher. It's not something that the interview participant necessarily is going to see. So this is really where you're building your survey that will be deployed through Network Canvas survey. And then with an interviewer, that's an application that is really meant to be um, deploying the interview. That is what the research participant actually engages with. That is what, um, um, you know, really the, what, when a participant thinks of Network Canvas, this is really what they're utilizing. Um, it's something that um, the researcher might um, utilize just to load the interview on to, um, into interviewer, and then the interviewer app is what actually gives it. Um, and then server is this application that is able to, so, so basically the protocols that are created within architect, the survey protocols, um, really server is meant to be this linkage between architect and between interviewer. It's meant to um, be a place to capture the data. It's meant to be a place to deploy to machines. And so if you have for example, a very large study with numerous pieces of um, hardware that are deploying Network Canvas, man, maybe many different laptops controlled by many different RAs. Server can be really useful because what it's going to do is it's going to take the architect, pro the protocol that was designed with an architect, and it's going to be able to deploy it to all of those pieces of hardware at once and to make sure that the right version of that protocol is deployed. Um, it is also able to capture the data back into it. So it's also able to be a place where you can have maybe 20 different interview machines and it can also bring all that data back together into one spot. But today we're actually not gonna be focusing much on server. And the reason for that is, and you can then export the data from server, of course. But today we're not gonna be talking much about server because really what we found is that when folks are getting started with Network Canvas, um, it's really overkill for what um, they need um, because you can also do the same things that server facilitates in a more maybe simple way. So you can build a protocol with an architect and then just load that protocol directly into interviewer if you have only one device, for example. Um, also, we've found that for a lot of, for, for really large studies, they might have one data manager where um, having a single instance of server running on a data manager's computer makes a lot of sense when you have one person who's controlling the data. But for um, a lot of folks who are getting started, they really 
don't have that same sort of scenario. Um, and so because of that, um, server is just a little bit overkill, a little bit unnecessary, and you can get the data directly out of Interviewer itself. You can export data from um, Interviewer. So today we're really just going to be focusing on Architect and Interviewer, but I want you to know that it exists. And if for some reason your use case does map onto what we were talking about, a larger study with numerous pieces of hardware, maybe with a single data manager, then we think server is probably great for you, but probably not for um, this introductory sort of workshop. It doesn't make sense to focus too much there. And so we'll primarily be talking about architect and interviewer today. Okay. Um, so I just want to quickly give you guys a little bit of an overview of some of the design principles that went behind Network Canvas that I think will also help explain how it works and how it functions. Um, so the first slide I have here is just we've really tried to design Network Canvas for intuitive understanding. And what that means is when it comes to in, um, interview participants and how they engage with the tool, we want everything to be as intuitive for them as possible so they understand what the task is immediately. And so um, we try to make everything very visually appealing. We try to um, really engage folks with touch and with trying to make these very abstract concepts like social networks as tangible as possible with folks seeing these physical representations of nodes on a screen and ties in between and, and having this task of drawing. We think that it makes um, everything a little bit more tangible to have it physically there. But it's not just intuitive, designed intuitively just for the research subjects either. So also, for example, with an architect, we've tried to use similar visual metaphors to make it really intuitive for researchers as well. So what that means is within um, architect, um, you're actually designing um, stages of, a, you're choosing and selecting stages to put onto a timeline. And so we're trying to avoid any sort of um, complicated scripting um, being necessary. We're trying to rely on um, these visual interfaces as much as possible, um, just trying to make things as simple as, as possible throughout. Um, another underlying principle that we've tried to follow is trying to design Network Canvas to be as flexible as possible. Um, all of our team, we're researchers in our own right, and we have sort of preconceived notions of what a network study might look like, but our community is very diverse and studies many different things. And so it was important for us to design a tool that's as usable for the entire community as possible. One way we've tried to do that is by really trying to design for, instead of trying to capture certain types of variables. Instead, we're really designing for the um, generation of nodes and edges, which is very different than what other tools might be doing. And so we've tried to think about how do we capture data in the most sort of fundamental way. Um, what we're actually seeing on the screen here um, are three different types of interfaces. Um, the first one is a name generator. Um, this is sort of a common flow within a typical network canvas interview or social network interview. You might have a name generator first, and then that name generator is going to produce nodes of some sort. And then you're going to have something, it says per alter form, but basically, um, you know, that is going to be some sort of a name interpreter. And then after that, you're going to have a sociogram um, or something where you're creating edges in between those nodes. So what we've tried to do is to create not just a name, name generator, but um, a number of different types of name generators. Um, you'll see some of those demonstrated today, um, but you're, we've tried to um, create name a selection of name generators that can be very flexibly modified by the researcher, not just the text, but even things like, um, you know, is this um, a roster? Is this um, 
um, something that requires just a very quick sort of name entry, or is this something that requires more data? And everything can be um, as modified as possible. We've tried to leave that up to the researcher. Um, per alter forms, there's a number of different um, sort of name interpreter um, questions or interfaces, excuse me, that um, researchers can select from. And then even within the sociogram, there's a number of different ways that data can be captured there. Um, and even the background image can be changed. So we've tried to, as much as we can, um, give a lot of that flexibility um, onto the researcher. Another important point about Network Canvas is both for participant security and then also to ensure that we're giving um, our research subjects the best experience um, possible when it comes to interacting with our software. We've designed Network Canvas to be given in person and interviewer assisted. So what that means is that the, the software in particular, um, Network Canvas um, interviewer is download it onto researcher controlled hardware. Um, so on a, this is not something that um, a URL is sent to a research subject and the research subject completes it completely on their own machine, um, at least not at this point. Right now, what we're able, what we have built the tool to do has been to um, be deployed on an interviewer machine and then with the interaction with the encouragement with um, the facilitation of the interviewer um, the interview is given it also has allowed us to focus more of the um, actual um, interfaces not necessarily on providing information about the um, what to do on the screen we think a lot of that comes very naturally but we've intentionally done that, if you, we have an interviewer there, they can assist with some of that direction and keep the screen uncluttered and keep the screen focused on just capturing the data. And then finally, we have designed our tool to be open source because we think it's really important that if this tool is going to um, survive, to thrive, we need a community behind it. Um, and so, um, we really welcome um, input. We welcome folks um, who are uh, technically savvy to contribute in some way to our project. Um, we've established a non-for-profit entity, um, Complex Data Collective or Codeco. Um, and yeah, we also have a GPL um, license. Um, and it's just important to us that this remains free, this remains open source for the community as much as possible. And just a few things I wanna to point to in terms of things in case you wanna learn more. So the first thing I would say is we had a manuscript come out last year um, in social networks. I would recommend that you guys check it out, especially if you're interested in learning more about the design decisions on the software. I'd also point you to our website, networkcanvas.com, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, it's also a place, it's home to a lot of different pieces of documentation. We've created tutorials, we've created how-to guides. Um, we've also created some videos. Um, there's just a lot on there. Um, and so, you know, some of um, your questions might be able to be answered by checking that out first. Um, I also want to encourage you to join our mailing list. If you aren't already, a link to it is available on our website, um, right at the bottom of the front page. And then finally, if you can't find um, out what you need, just email us, um, info at networkcanvas.com. And that is my section of the welcome today. Um, please let me know if you have any questions, but. The next um, part of today is going to be introducing interviewer, and I'm going to hand it over to Josh. I'm Joshua Melville, and for the last five years, I have been uh, designing and developing the Network Canvas software that we're talking about today uh, firsthand. So uh, my, my background was in sociology, and the tool itself actually came out of some of my, uh, my PhD work and also a collaration with the uh, the rest of the wonderful team over in Chicago. 
And so this has been a, a huge uh, privilege of mine to work on this. And um, this is something that I'm really passionate about, not just the things we've built, but the principles that we've built them on. Um, so as Michelle said, I'm gonna to talk to you specifically about Interviewer today. And this is gonna be a really quick whistle-stop tour of the software, just to kind of orient you um, to what it is and how it works. So uh, just to recap a little bit of what Michelle said, we really think of Network Canvas as a whole suite of tools that kind of take you from the ideation and design process of your study all the way to the uh, analysis, if you wanna go that far. An interviewer sits in the middle and it's, it's kind of the centerpiece of all of that. It's where the protocol you design meets the participants that you're interviewing and produces the data ultimately that's gonna be the substance of your work. So um, you really think of interviewer as a, a purpose-built data collection app, but for network data. And that last part is um, really important because obviously we've had survey software for years and years now. And um, the difference is really that this is one of the first, not the first, but one of the first uh, that is built specifically around the needs of personal networks research or networks research more, generally speaking. Um, and again, as Michelle said, this does have some implications. So uh, just to recap, this is not something that's going to be installed on a participant device. This is something that you install on your own hardware, be it a laptop, be it a tablet. Uh, and we're going to discuss devices specifically uh, later on. So um, the idea really is that you will need to manage and configure interviewer on your own hardware. But once the interview begins, you're going to pass over control to your participant and uh, We've designed it in such a way that it, it will hopefully be uh, intuitive for them. So um, we really, one way you can think about it is that there are backstage and there are front stage parts of the app where the backstage is where you will hang out, you'll configure the behavior and the data aspects of the software. And then the front stage is the interview experience itself. And that's where you hand over to your participants. So uh, I'm gonna, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into a screen share here. Um, just bear with me a second. Okay, uh, everybody seeing my screen? Good stuff. So um, opening interviewer. Now, uh, quick note, if you want to follow along, you're very welcome, but because this is gonna be such a quick uh, run through, it might be best to just watch and then you can try some of these things later on your own computer. Uh, but please feel free to stop me if something's not clear, because I'm going to have to move uh, quite quickly to cover everything. So opening interviewer for the first time, this is what you'll see. Uh, and this is an area of the app that we call the start screen. Uh, and this is the primary backstage area of the app that's researcher facing. So um, there are a few things that I'm going to talk to you about the start screen. But one of the main tasks that you're all going to have when you run a study using Network Canvas and using Interviewer specifically is to make sure that you adapt the interview experience so that the way the app behaves and the way it looks is uh, optimized as well as it can be for the research you're doing and for the participants you have and also for the device that you're running on. So um, before I say anything else, I'm gonna go straight into the settings menu here in the top left and just talk you through what I think are some of the most important things to consider. So um, over here on the side, we've got a few different panels. I'm gonna start with the visual preferences because I think this is the most important one. Now, the, the feature that most people will want to change and make sure they get right is the text sizing of the app. It's very common that people say the text is too small or they work with a population that needs things to be a little bit bigger. Now, the way text sizing works with an interviewer is not quite how you might be used to. So if I just show you here, when I resize the window, you'll notice that everything gets bigger at the same time. And that's because we use a concept called dynamic scaling, which means that the uh, proportion of all the elements on the screen grow and shrink together. Now, we do that because we think that lets us have a greater degree of control over the design of the uh, interview experience. Um, so to change the size of the text and the elements on the screen, we actually need to adjust the whole scale factor. So if you see here, we have an option for interface scale by default at 100%. If we bump it up to 
you can see not just the text gets bigger, but also the spacing around elements, the proportion of the screen that's taken up by the sidebar versus the main component, as well as other interface elements like the close button. Now, if you want to disable that scaling, that's the option below. In some circumstances, this might be preferable. And now when I resize the window, you'll see the rest of the elements remain the same size and the text simply reflows. So I'd encourage you to experiment with that and make sure the behavior is what you need and what your participants need. I'm gonna go ahead and turn dynamic scaling back on. Okay, next, Ooh, one, one thing before I move on, interface scaling can also be reduced. So you can have below 100% values. Uh, and as you may see when you build your protocol, there is a trade-off between the legibility and the amount of information density on the screen. So if you deal with particularly long uh, values, maybe it's uh, a roster that has uh, extremely long labels for nodes, or whether it's a ordinal interface where your option values are very long, um, you may find that reducing the text size helps you to eke out a few extra characters so that the text isn't truncated. Uh, so as I said, I'm gonna leave this at 110% because I think that might make it a bit easier for you to read uh, on the screen capture. Next option, running full screen. And this really goes back to another point that Michelle mentioned, which is that one of our key design decisions was to try to create an interview environment that removed the baggage of using a computer and uh, try to minimize any visual complexity. And so uh, part of the way we do that is that we intend the app to run in a full screen mode so that the rest of the operating system, whatever environment it might be, is hidden and the participant can focus on the task itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and enable that. Hopefully that's still sharing properly. Um, now, the reason this isn't on by default is just because it can be a bit disorienting if you're not used to an app opening in this kind of kiosk mode. Um, Windows users, for example, uh, are not so used to properly full screen apps as opposed to just being maximized. This will hide everything, including the clock, the taskbar, and to get out of that, you'll need to use the Alt key or of course, toggle the full screen button. Nevertheless, this is how we intend the app to run. And then the final option here is hinting at a little bit of the stuff that I, I discussed a moment ago about the way that your device can also impact the data collection. So um, again, as Michelle mentioned, we designed the software to be touch optimized. So it's really, uh, a series of interfaces built on tactility and touch-based interactions. Uh, and that obviously lends itself really well to being used on tablet computers. And a lot of the early push that we made was to show people this running on an iPad or running on an Android tablet. Now, over time, we realized that a lot of those devices don't have physical keyboards. And the consequence of that is that a software keyboard will come up anytime a participant needs to enter text. Now that is quite disastrous in terms of being able to show uh, any amount of data really on the screen because these keyboards can cover up to two thirds of the screen at a time. So what we did was we created an adapted version of some of our most commonly used text entry um, sections of the app, which allows you to keep the area you're typing into in focus while the software keyboard is visible. So if you're thinking about running on a device that doesn't have a physical keyboard, this would be something to experiment with. Uh, I'm gonna leave it for now because I'm obviously running on a Mac, I have a keyboard. Um, just cover the other options here quickly. Uh, data export is gonna be discussed by Pat, but the long and short of it is that we support GraphML and CSV export with some various options aside from that. Pairing is a function associated with the server app, which Again, we're not going to cover today, but if we did use it, this would be where we set the way that this interview device appears within server. And developer options are mostly not going to be useful for the majority of you, um, with one exception, and that is this function down the bottom here, which allows you to generate test sessions. Now, uh, I'm sure a lot of you before when conducting research have been working on a protocol, but also wanted in parallel to understand the way the data is gonna look when it comes out so that maybe you could uh, test analysis scripts or maybe you could pass off the task of developing cleaning scripts to somebody else. Now this test session feature 
allows you to automatically generate dummy interviews using any protocol that you have installed on the device. So it's a little bit of an advanced use case, but it could be useful uh, for some of you. Okay, so closing the settings for now, having configured the behavior and the look and feel of the device, let's take a look at the start screen. So the way this works, this uh, backstage area of the app, is it's a card-based interface where each card represents a task or groups tasks together. So the first task we've got at the start is the welcome screen, a little bit of an introduction to the software and links to the three most important resources when you're first getting started, which is the overview video, which hopefully you've seen, the documentation website, which outside of uh, this workshop is the single most important resource for teaching yourself how to use the software. And please tell us, by the way, if something's missing or can be improved on the documentation site. Um, it's very labor intensive to produce, but it's also very important that we get that right. So we appreciate your help. And um, the last button here is a one-click installation of a sample interview protocol, which is designed to go through uh, everything that I'm going through now, except in greater detail. And that's something that um, you're very welcome to go through in your own time. I'm actually going to install that uh, in just a moment, so you'll get a taste of it from that. Uh, scrolling, the import protocol section gives us two options. Um, the first is to import from a URL. So some of you will have project websites, um, you may have a SharePoint, you may have some kind of cloud provider that lets you host your interview protocol file. That's a .NET work canvas, sorry, .NET canvas file that is produced by Architect. If you put that somewhere which has a public URL, uh, you can very easily import the protocol to interviewer using that. Um, but probably the most common way of doing it is going to be from a file which is directly available on the device. And that's what I'm going to do now. So if I click import from file, I have a big folder here with a lot of protocols that I've been working on over the years. The sample protocol, which again is the same one that's available at the top. I'm going to click open and you'll see the app unzips, extracts and installs the protocol into the uh, app data folder for interviewer. OK, so a couple of things to point out. The first is um, that now we have a new section that's appeared at the top here. And the, the way that these start screen sections work is that they appear or disappear contextually based on what you can do at any given time. So now we have a protocol available. We have the ability to start a new interview using that protocol. OK, um, later on when we uh, create some interview data, options will appear, sections will appear that allow us to manage and export that data. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Can't actually see the screen, so please let me know if there's any questions, teammates. Um, right, so let's go ahead and jump into the interview experience and take a look at what that's like. So we start an interview very simply. The protocol card itself is another consistently represented tactile object within the Network Canvas software. So I can go ahead and click on it. And the first thing we'll need to do is to define a case ID, which will let us uniquely identify this case. Now I say uniquely, it's really, um, it's pseudo unique. So what I mean by that is in the scenario where you have multiple interviewers working in parallel, there's no real way, practically speaking, for us to coordinate which IDs have been used. So what this is really in practice is a human readable version of that. And uh, I encourage you to think about a system for naming your cases so that it can be uh, uh, scriptable. For example, you may use a consistent prefix and suffix, and that can help when you're doing your analysis and you have a whole folder full of these data files and you want to loop through them um, because the case ID you use here will appear in the file name of the data you export. So, to simplify things, I'm just going to use my name for now, and I'm going to click on the Start Interview button, and this takes us immediately into the front stage area of the app, the participant-facing portion. Um, so let's do a quick overview of the interface we're seeing here. Now, the, the majority of the screen is taken up by this area here, and this is where whatever task uh, you're currently on will be shown. So this is the, the primary part of the interface. 
And to the left, we've got a navigation system. And this is designed for participants to use. So it's extremely simple. So once again, the level of computer literacy we're assuming here is extremely low. Um, a forward button to move forwards. And you can see there's a, a kind of visual indication that we're sliding forwards there. A, back, a backwards button to move backwards. A timeline in the middle that shows our progress through the interview. And a menu button at the top. So let's just hop into the menu quickly and cover what's in there. Um, first most important thing is we have an interview summary card here, which gives us some statistics about the interview so far. We have the duration, case ID, which we can change if we need to. And then this section here, which is actually quite useful, this shows you the number of nodes of each type that have been created in the interview so far, as well as the number of edges. So you could use that if you needed to keep track of, for example, nominating a minimum number of people or a maximum number of places or something like that. You could keep track of it here. Um, over on the main menu portion of this screen, exit interview button. So aside from finishing the interview by reaching the end, this is the way that you will leave the interview screen and return to the start screen, okay? Uh, device settings is what we looked at before. So if you need to hop in and change the text size during an interview, maybe something's not rendering properly, maybe a participant is struggling to read uh, some text, you can do it here. And then the interview stages menu. Now, this is uh, a further reinforcement of another one of the ideas that Michelle touched on and that Bernie is going to be uh, really exploring in some great detail. And this is kind of one of the fundamental metaphors of the software, which is that an interview protocol is really a timeline of stages. And you can see what I mean here. We have a list of all the different screens in the interview. And next to that, we have this red bar and circles. And I, I always like to say that I think this looks like a a public transit map or something like a bus route or an underground map um, and each circle represents a stop along that route now of course you can configure the protocol to skip these screens or show them but the point here is that this menu provides you with a really quick visual overview of everything that's happening in your interview and also shows you where you're currently at so the the uh the green background shows you where you're currently at. And as you can see there, I can click to move to a specific point in the interview should I need to. For example, if the participant uh, remembers that they needed to add an, an additional alter earlier in the interview, you could quickly hop in, find the name generator, I'll use the filter to show you what that looks like. And then I can quickly click to it. So um, you might have noticed I used a shortcut to get to that menu, which was just to click the timeline itself. So that's quite handy, that saves you a click. Um, okay, so that's the general like user interface of Interviewer. That's how you get around and do most of the common tasks. So um, now I just wanna talk quickly about uh, and show you examples of the fundamental building blocks of network interviewing that Michelle mentioned before. And those are of course, uh, name generation, name interpreting and edge creation for our purposes. So, um, as Michelle mentioned, we try to build into the software a tremendous amount of flexibility in the way that protocols can be designed. And what that means in practice is that you as a researcher have some really important methodological choices to make about how you either front load or back load certain data collection tasks. And what I mean by that is you have a choice in how high burden you make certain elements of the interview. Um, now, there's a certain amount of burden that's irreducible, um, but the psychology of how data is captured and the sequence that that happens in can play an important role in the amount of data and the quality of the data that you end up getting. So quite a good illustration of that is the name generator, or rather the name generators that we support in this software. So starting here, we have um, the lowest burden and the quickest and simplest means of adding alters to the interview. Now these, these name generators have a common anatomy. So there's a prompt at the top. You can have multiple prompts if you'd like on a single screen, or you can split them into multiple screens. Um, there's pros and cons of each of those approaches. And then there's an action button here in the bottom corner. 
very clearly just inviting us to add a person to the interview. So this is called the quick add name generator. And all that is required to, to create an alter on the screen is to add a label. So I'm going to go ahead and just add some of my uh, teammates. Whoop, if I can spell. Uh, and let's do, let's do me as well. And you can see I'm able to very quickly create alters just by typing a label and clicking enter. Um, alters are represented by circles of a specific color. And as we'll see in the architect section, this is all part of reinforcing the consistent visual representation of the building blocks of the network to the participant and also to you as the researcher. So um, increasing the complexity a little bit, let's think about the scenario, which is quite common, where you'll have multiple name generators and uh, participants will often have the urge to renominate somebody that they've already mentioned. And so the way that we handle this, uh, or at least one of the ways in Network Canvas is to introduce the concept of a side panel. So you can see here, we have uh, a separate prompt here. We're asking about who we've discussed social networks research with, and I may want to nominate Pat. And I do that by dragging and dropping from the side panel to the main panel. That's one of the tactile interactions uh, that I was discussing earlier. Of course, I can still nominate additional people on this screen as well. So that's a name generator with a side panel. But what about if we want to collect uh, more information along with the alter nomination? So what about if we want to get some attribute information as well? Um, we need more than just a label. This is where we can uh, increase the complexity, front load more of the burden, and use a different version of the name generator, which implements forms. Now, forms are one of the most powerful and, if I can say, one of the most dangerous concepts within the software. Powerful because, as you'll see here, when I click the Add button, I now am presented with a completely customizable form where, I, as a researcher, I could collect any number of attributes of uh, several different types. So extremely powerful, dangerous precisely because of that. Um, the temptation becomes overwhelming almost to add all of your variables to this name generation process, which of course has the effect of making it extremely tedious to nominate alters. Um, but this is one of the balancing acts that I think Bernie's going to discuss in greater detail. So just to, just to go back a second, you'll see we're now talking about um, places, healthcare providers rather than people. So I've configured the protocol to have a different icon representing a place rather than a person. And once again, clicking the icon now shows me a form rather than a simple label. Uh, I'm going to give it the label hospital. And then we have a non-text kind of uh, variable here, an attribute. This is um, a date time input or rather a date picker input where I can choose my visit date. And then I have a free text input. Um, where I can uh, provide as much information as I want. If I click finished, same as before, the um, alt is created. It's blue because this is a different type of alter. Again, doing that reinforcement of the uh, different types of nodes, having a consistent visual representation. Just checking quickly at the interview summary so far, you can see we're nine minutes in. We have six people, we have one clinic in our interview. So far, so good. Now, um, one last scenario to talk about, because I know some people are interested in this. Um, what about if the uh, interview is not based around eliciting alters, but if the whole bounds of the network are already known, for example, if you have a roster and you simply wish for the participant to choose from within those names. So we actually have a dedicated interface for roster name generation. And um, the way this works is that the roster is presented on the left-hand side in the form of these uh, visually customizable cards. And to nominate an alter, the participant simply drags from the left to the right. To remove, same, but in reverse. Extremely simple, uh, very fast 
tactile interaction. Now, as I mentioned, the display of the cards is completely customizable, as is the behavior of the filter and search functionality. So you can choose as a researcher which properties are sortable, um, which properties are displayed on the cards, and the way that the um, search behavior works in terms of its accuracy. Okay. Okay, so that covers kind of very quickly the name generation functionality in the software. Uh, let's talk a little bit about name interpreting. Now, you've seen forms, which are extremely powerful and allow you to collect almost any kind of data. But um, with Network Canvas, obviously, we're extremely focused on the idea of reducing response burden wherever possible. So we implemented a number of specific interfaces targeted at some of the most traditionally burdensome parts of network interviewing. Uh, to give you an example, this is an interface that we call the, uh, sorry, the ordinal bin, and it is designed specifically for ordinal categorical data, in this case, communication frequency. And now to ask this question about communication frequency per alter in a form would be an extremely burdensome thing to do. However, Doing it on this screen is a simple case of dragging and dropping into specific bins. Now, I'm sure you've seen this kind of thing before. It's perhaps not as uh, amazing as it used to be. People used to lose their minds at this kind of thing four or five years ago. But it's still, I think, a good illustration of the power of having a tool that's designed specifically around network interviewing as opposed to just doing uh, the general kind of surveying approach of dumping everything in a front-loaded question. And this is a choice that you can make. You may still wish to dump it into a front-loaded question, or you may wish to use something like this. Um, it's your choice. Okay, so um, let's talk about edge creation now. Uh, and to talk about edge creation, we're gonna move on to the sociogram screen. Now, um, you may or may not be aware that Network Canvas has its uh, kind of theoretical origins in a method called the participant-aided sociogram, which uh, of course, Bernie and others played a big part in uh, describing and defining. Now, the participant-aided sociogram was a very visual method for personal network capture that was built around the sociogram as the kind of primary object of the interview. So in Network Canvas, we've done the best job we can at digitizing that process. Um, so there are a few things that you can do on the sociogram that are extremely powerful. Um, the first is that you can create uh, layouts of the alters that have been named. Uh, and by you, I, of course, mean the participant. And the power of that approach is that these layouts can be meaningful to them. And without going into it, there's, uh, I think it's fair to say, enough research at this point showing that uh, user-defined layouts or participant-defined layouts that are meaningful to them help dramatically with uh, network cognition and can potentially speed up tasks associated with finding network members that have certain attributes, should that be something you're doing. So for example, if I subsequently, subsequently wanted to ask, which of these people uh, have you had sex with? Which of these people have you done drugs with? Or an attribute question like that, having a participant generated layout would be a, a, a powerful uh, optimization. With that said, we also do support uh, automatic layout using a spring embedding algorithm. That's a relatively new feature. So if your um, relationships, if your, if your alters, sorry, have no real implicit spatial uh, relationship, for example, they can't be grouped based on if they know one another or if they spend time together, you could think about using the spring embedder to automatically lay out the alters in a, in a way that's sensible. Away from that, um, the sociogram is also the primary way that we generate edges in Network Canvas. And it, once again, it's a very simple and tactile process of consecutively tapping nodes. Um, one of the things I know Bernie's gonna talk about more is the way that the ontological flexibility of the software allows us to think almost for the first time about modeling very complex um, multiple types of edges within personal networks. So in this case, we've added a second prompt, uh, which is asking for a second edge type. And you can see this one is represented in red. It's a conflict edge. And that's in contrast with the um, social edge here, people spending time together without the participant being there. You can see how both those edges can coexist and they are separate. 
Um, now, of course, back to the flexibility point we were making earlier, that's not the only way that we can uh, create edges. Uh, we have a dedicated systematic appraisal of edges called a dyad census, which some of you may be familiar of, uh, with. It's used extensively in certain uh, disciplines. And this will essentially cycle through every possible combination of alters and ask the participant to either confirm or deny the presence of an edge. And I really like the way this works, even if it's kind of high burden. So we again have the prompt at the top, we have the two alters we're considering, we have a simple yes, no evaluation of if they spend time together. Clicking yes, creates the edge and moves to the next pair. That's a really nice interaction that kind of minimizes the burden of doing this kind of thing. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna to skip to the end of the interview now. I've shown you the kind of core tasks of network interviewing and some of the ways that they can be flexibly implement, implemented in the software. Uh, at the end of the interview, you'll see a screen like this, which is automatically generated by the software. I'm um, clicking finish, it'll take you back to the start screen. And now you'll see that the uh, interview section has got a twin underneath it, which allows us to resume that interview that we were just in. And we have a new section appeared below, which allows us to manage and export our interview data. Uh, so just reinforcing the idea that the options available on the start screen appear contextually. Okay, uh, I think that's about all I want to talk about in interviewer. That was very quick though. So does anybody have any questions at this point just on that? I don't think so. Oh, how many edge types attributes can we customize? Um, it's unlimited. Uh, it's practically limited by the complexity of the task, but you can define as many node and edge types as you'd like. And actually, one of the really interesting avenues of future research that I would love to see is people exploring, uh, kind of doing things monolithically with one type of edge and node versus spreading things out into a kind of hypergraph. And, and that's another area of functionality that we're also looking at ourselves. Because uh, one limitation I should add is that uh, interfaces such as the sociogram can only currently represent a single node type at a time. So that's something to bear in mind. Okay, I'm just going to quickly head over to quick discussion about choosing a device. Because um, as I mentioned, this is a really important part of getting into your experience right. And there are three concerns I just want to emphasize to you. Um, the first one is about keyboards because a ton of people send us their protocols and they're full of very beautifully thought out, elaborate um, text-based instruments for their uh, name generators and for their per alter forms later in their interview. But they haven't considered the fact that they want to run this study on a small device that doesn't have a physical keyboard. Um, so keep in mind uh, the, the device you choose should have a keyboard if you're doing any, any amount of text entry. Um, the second point is to remember to think through your data management workflow more generally. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you choose to run interviewer on a uh, tablet device, you need to understand how to get data onto and off of that device, because that's beyond the scope of the software to really help you with. And it may require you to install uh, third party file management apps, for example, I know on Android, um, to be able to just save a file to the devices uh, internal storage, you might need to install the file management app. Um, and the third point is really just that importance is not simply a vanity, vanity uh, metric. It's actually something that will impact the quality of the experience for your participants. It will change how they feel about being part of your research. And it may uh, surprise you how much it affects the quality of the data you get. So a lot of our interactions are quite graphically intensive. And if those things stutter and perform poorly, um, it's going to be less than ideal for your participants. So just quickly to summarize the four platforms we support, you've got Android tablets, which are very cheap. They're quite widely available. The drawbacks being that they're often not very powerful. And there are only really two uh, big manufacturers producing them these days. They tend to be more for media consumption, so they're quite wide. Um, 
Chromebooks are interesting. They can, they can increasingly, they can run Android apps, um, but the performance and the quality of the hardware can vary quite a bit. Um, and then of course the iPad, uh, which was something for a long time that we considered to be the kind of marquee platform for the software, but that unfortunately we can no longer recommend because um, of our inability to distribute the app through the Apple App Store. Um, if you have loads of iPads for some reason and you're desperate to use them, then it's still something that's possible. Um, please talk to us about that. Uh, and then normal laptops. Um, and I guess just skipping to the chase, that would be our recommendation. If you're looking at purchasing a device specifically for running Interviewer, look at a uh, Windows or you can run Linux if you're comfortable with it, but primarily a Windows laptop with a touch screen uh, from one of the big manufacturers. That's going to give you the best combination of um, features and usability. Um, there's some more information on the documentation website about this stuff. Uh, and if you're really struggling, give us an email and maybe we can help you choose between a few different options. Michael, I see you have a question. In practice, is there a maximum number of alters to gather and still easy, easily visualize on the sociograph? So we, um, we uh, designed it to be able to accommodate approximately 40 alters. And we based that on looking at the distribution of a really huge personal network study in Chicago. Um, and 40 was the largest that we had. And I think probably if you get around that number, uh, there are some things that you should think about to potentially limit things a little bit. But 40 is the upper limit, I would say. Um, is it possible to link participant data over time? Okay, so this is a great question. Um, longitudinal interview functionality was something that we really, really wanted to include from the start because uh, Basically, the studies that produce this software lent heavily on longitudinal observations. We know people want to do it. Um, unfortunately, there's no way to automatically do it right now. Um, there are some ways to do it using rosters, and there are definitely ways that you can merge uh, networks, like in your, in your back end, in your cleaning, in your analysis steps. But if you wanted to pick up where you left off, that would be something that's a bit more difficult but it would be something that somebody who was committed enough could definitely look at implementing uh, themselves if they wanted to. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen because most of this is um, going to be done uh, alternating between, um, between a presentation which is structured and uh, architect, the program itself. Um, and so for that, uh, I guess it's good for me to cycle back and forth. Now I'm gonna be using two protocols. Uh, the first one is a really bare bones protocol, which is not quite filled in. Um, and we're going to show you some things. Uh, I'll give you some ideas about how to do stuff in situ. I'm not going to do too much in situ because uh, only to the length of time. But uh, we'll see how to get through some of the, uh, the ideas and concepts discussed already. The second protocol, um, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to look at that is what I might call the sort of the minimum uh, viable protocol for doing a whole net study in a classroom. And so I'm gonna use that as an opportunity to introduce how we get a roster into a uh, network canvas and also how to use stage level filtering with a roster. So that way you can distinguish uh, ego or the respondent from the other people in the classroom. Um, then at the end, we're gonna have hopefully uh, some time for some network canvas, uh, maybe gotchas or style issues and have an approach to that. and. Uh, then it's, a, I guess, time for a break at um, 10, to, 10 to whatever hour you're at, <laughs> wherever you are around the world, um, unless you're in Newfoundland, in which case it's uh, 20 past, um, uh, for those of you who, uh, who know of my, my dear province from back, back home. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the whole screen, and uh, then I'll get a confirmation uh, that I can do that. And just, uh, can everyone see my screen? It should have a Zoom on it, I guess. Now, if I go and slide over to here, we can uh, see the presentation, Network Canvas Architects, Concepts to Practices, yes. Uh, everyone can see that. And you can't actually see my thumbnails or anything. You, that's all how Zoom works and wonderful. Okay, so um, just to confirm once again, in our Google Drive, I will be using uh, this uh, architect demo. This is just really simple. And uh, there was a version that was up uh, a week ago. I've changed only a little itty bitty of it, so it shouldn't be an issue. And I have uploaded this whole network demo 
um, as well. Finally, you'll notice that the PDF of my talk is available in case you would like to follow along on your own uh, later. Okay, so here we are. Well, this is the program architect. This is where we would design network canvas uh, studies or protocols as we call them. Protocols then are the instruction set and resources that you would then load into uh, Interviewer. We've covered in the prior section, you know, how to look at that and get them in, but let's have a look at say maybe X-raying them. Um, Okay, so once again, to follow along, there's all that there, it's available. Now I'm not gonna go full screen in this, but I hope that the, uh, the text is large enough because this way I think um, it's a little easier rather than zigzagging between um, presenter tools and whatever. So first principles of, uh, of network software, I just want us to think about the different kinds of objects and the kinds of data about those objects that we think about in a network canvas. And actually this is one of the places where network canvas distinguishes itself from say traditional survey software. Traditional survey software normally has what we would call input controls. And we have input controls too. So we'll, we'll see those later. Josh mentioned the, that earlier, but we actually have the notions of networks as objects. And so we might have an ego as an object. I've put ego here as a rounded square to signify that you don't actually see him or her or them. Um, and then we have the actual notions of the nodes. Now nodes in network canvas are uh, nodes in a graph sense, but we use the language of egocentric analysis often within architect um, when um, giving some guidance. So I'll generally refer to them as say, these would be alters that you would nominate. Uh, they would be, and if there's some relationship between ego and alter, we could call it a direct tie or a property of alter in fact. And then we have this notion of indirect ties. That is um, a tie that is being seen by, by ego. So I may see two friends and I can establish whether they know each other or whether they share a meal or whether there's some more, you know, do other serious things that we would be interested in public health, drug use, sex, et cetera. For the most part, I'll be using sharing a meal as the sort of anchoring uh, or organizing uh, principle here or organizing set of questions. Okay, so we have ego, alter, ego, alter, edge, and an alter, alter, edge. So now to remind, <clears throat> you can have multiple node types in any given network canvas interview. So here's an example of some of them. We don't specify them ahead of time. We uh, ask you to specify that, but we don't, do know that architect requires you to have a node type for just about any screen, except for information screens in between the stages. Network Canvas also allows you to have multiple edge types, which can be defined by a user, and you can set both the name and the color of them. Now, you'll notice that the, the dots on either side are gray here. I want to indicate, um, as referenced by Josh earlier, that you can, um, you can create edges uh, between any type of nodes, but only within that type of nodes, certainly currently. And so you can create a, um, a friend edge and then apply that to the people who share meals. So which of these people share a meal with each other? You can have that friend edge and also for a different type of node, maybe uh, the nodes might be uh, businesses. And so if you have, a, I don't know, if you see businesses are friendly, I'm not sure why that would make sense, but you know, you can do it. The point is, is that nodes are objects, edges are objects, and then we can link the nodes using the edges, but they're not like one is necessarily entailed by the other. And we'll see how that works now in a minute. What we're gonna look at in Network Canvas or in Architect requires us a, I guess it's kind of an orientation sense here. Uh, and Michelle first introduced this. There's a notion of an interface and an interface is a, a way we collect data. It's, um, we might think of it as an instrument with certain affordances. They might have um, buttons or squares or circles or something. So we might talk about the categorical bin interface. Now a stage is a specific instance of an interface. And that's something that, that you would create. So you can create multiple stages with multiple categorical bins. And so each one is a categorical bin interface, but they are indeed separate stages. Some stages are just one question. So uh, we can see some examples of those below. And again, a categorical bin would be one of those where it's just um, one question on that page at a time. So that's, um, that's one prompt. On the other hand, we have the opportunity to have uh, multiple prompts on the same page. 
Sometimes that happens sequentially. So we can have a name generator with multiple prompts. It's just one stage. And the first prompt might be discuss important matters. The next prompt might be um, giving you social support. And the prompt is just like we would think in, uh, um, in sort of everyday conversations, maybe in a question. So please list the people that you discuss important matters with. I mean, we don't normally say it like that in conversation, but of course, in, uh, in these sorts of interviews, it's really important to be especially clear about those prompts, including things like how long uh, in the last six months, for example, et cetera. And we leave that to the researcher, but we give you the space for that prompt. So these work together to um, you create a whole, uh, an entire network interview. Now, if we go over into architect here and we can see some of the ones that I've been working on, and I'll go into architect demo. Once again, you can see mirrored from, uh, from interviewer, the same sort of almost, uh, you know, uh, the tube map sort of a thing where we have stops and you can think of ways in which you can either just go linearly down the flow or that you can insert something in between the different stages. Now you'll notice each one of these is a stage. This is a stage called ego form and this is a stage called name gen quick. Now it's a stage that uses a specific interface. So the interfaces there, you can select from a variety of interfaces that we have available. Now you'll notice up here, here are some examples of interfaces and a, I guess a, a kind of a weird conversion book. Don't mind that, let's pop that down there. Um, and so for example, we have name generators using forms, name generators using QuickCAD. I'll talk a little more about forms in a minute. We'll get a sense of those. And you've seen some of that already. Uh, some rosters. Now, for what it's worth, we actually just have one roster now. This is, um, I should have updated this. Um, our roster is adaptive, as Josh pointed out, in terms of either if you have a really long one, it can give you just autocomplete or a more reasonable one, and then you can sort of scroll through the options and, and select them. Um, and these here will be examples of um, ways in which you can add data to edges. This is a dyad census. So we'll iteratively go through every possible dyad pair and say, you know, are they friends? Are they ties? And so you would select one of these interfaces in order to either create network canvas objects or add attribute data to those objects. Now, what sort of objects are we talking about? Ego, alter, direct tie or ego alter tie, an indirect tie, an alter alter tie. And uh, what sort of data are we talking or attributes are we talking about? We'll get to the attributes in a bit, but let's first look at how we can include a network object in the interview. Now, the reason I say include a network object, and not generate or create a network object is because sometimes we might already have some data we, um, we're working with, like a roster. And what we wanna think about is how we're gonna include nodes, people usually from that roster into the interview, into what we might call the alter pool, all of the alters that we can make use of for that interview or for that specific node type. Okay, so how do we include an ego? Well, ego is included by default. Um, first, you give ego a participant ID, and we mentioned that in the interview session. And then you can also get data about ego through an ego level form. Now, the form can include lots of different um, uh, input controls, each for different data types. But we'll park that for now, because that's this thing about a form that can uh, be the case, whether it's an ego form or a form for other kinds of objects. Now, including alters, how do we include alters in the, uh, in the interview? Well, as seen before, we can use a name generator, quick add. So you can just quickly add a name, and uh, Josh has entered some names in there, one after the other. You can also do it using a form. And what the form does is that as you enter a name, then a form pops up and you can add some data about that uh, interviewee. And then finally, you can add it from a roster. Now, these all end up going into an alter pool. And the alter pool can be seen as sort of these dots here, but they're not exclusively these dots. The alter pool includes all of the nodes of a particular node type. Sometimes those nodes will be shown on the screen and sometimes they won't. Now, that can be a bit tricky for people. And what's happened is that in the past that um, uh, if people misunderstand that, 
they may either add a node twice on uh, one screen and then add a, like I'll add mom on this screen and then on the next screen, I'll create a new node called mom. And what we really want is to be able to ensure that you have a single alter pool of alter objects that you draw upon through different screens. And so for example, as shown, we would use something like a side panel. So imagine if you have a number of either stages or a number of prompts and you're asking people, so here's an example, please nominate people that you've shared a meal with in the last month. And so with Alice, Bob, and Cam. Um, and then down below, you'd have a second prompt. Please nominate with anyone with whom you've discussed important matters. Now I say here, new people can be selected using the button in the lower right. I mean, it's not shown, but you've seen it. Um, or previously nominated people can be dragged over from this side. And so here are previously nominated people, and that's a side panel. Now in architect, the side panel um, happens in any name generator prompt. So if we go over to architect here and we see the name generator, you'll notice I've already had elicited a node type. We've only got one node type in this, um, in this study so far. In theory, we could create a new node type, give it a name, a color, and an icon. We have a couple icons to choose from now, but I'm not going to. Uh, we're just gonna stick with this. We see there's a person node type. And so we actually, um, when we do this, we're gonna add uh, the name variable. It's really important that every node has a name variable, all lowercase, and that network canvas is gonna use that name variable to present it elsewhere. Now you'll see here in this particular name generator, we have two prompts. The first was the meal one, and then the second was the discuss important matters one. You'll also notice down here that we have a side panel. So the side panel is something that you could toggle on or off. I've toggled it on and it says previously nominated. Data source, use the network from an in-person interview or you can also use network data file or a roster. But in this case, we're gonna use an in-progress interview. So that's all good. And that's pretty much it um, for this stage, but we can preview this and I'll show you how that works in interview. Now you notice that in architect, that means you can preview <clears throat> what things look like an interviewer. But remember that um, two things. First, when you do this, uh, the program doesn't have any memory of what's happened before. So every time you preview, you'd have to enter new data if you're testing a form. But the good news is you can also actually do the entire interview in the preview and kind of zigzag through them if that's necessary. Because maybe sometimes you might want to nominate some nodes on an earlier form and then return to where you are to kind of test that form. So here we are, we're on the name gen quick and we can see this. So once again, um, Alice, uh, oh, it's, I have Barb, and then uh, Cam. And so there's three people that I've shared a meal with in the last month. Once again, you know, in that prompt, we're trying to give some sort of boundary so that we can um, uh, elicit the ties more effectively. Now, if we go down here to the next one, we can see what we don't wanna do is add Alice and Bob again as new nodes. So we had that side panel and now we can have previously nominated and we drag this into the pane over here uh, and, and so forth. Maybe, maybe all of them. Now you'll notice it disappeared, but maybe I don't actually discuss important matters with Cam. So we can drag that back. So you can see that zigzagging happen here and we can add someone new um, and I will add dot. Okay, so you'll notice now that we're on the second prompt. What if I actually think, hey, maybe Maybe I did share a meal with Dot, but I didn't share a meal with Ellen. So it's, well, how would that happen? Well, if we go up right here, it says, please nominate the people that you've shared a meal with in the last month. Dot and Ellen are now available because they're part of the total alter pool. So we can use them and drag them in here. This way we can, it's one of the ways in which we can ensure that uh, respondents um, as they nominate new people, we are able to cross-check that they're, they're also applying to other questions. It's common for people in an interview to be um, eliciting people through a variety of different prompts, each prompt kind of tapping into a little bit of one's memory or experience, um, and then trying to think about all the attributes that may correspond to each of them. Okay, so now moving back here, uh, unsafe changes, with, yeah, sure, that's fine. Uh, now, moving back here to this, to the side panel, we might also want to think about ego alter ties. 
Now, there's a difference here between an altar and an ego altar tie. And that difference is conceptual. It's not necessarily manifested in network canvas. It's something you would have to consider. Um, the difference is that an altar is an object. It's a, maybe a person or a place or something. And an ego altar tie is the relationship. So now every time we nominate someone, say, that we've shared a meal with, that really means that there is a tie. It's not just they're a person, but they're a person with whom we share a tie. So perhaps we would like to signal that in the, in the place where we nominate people, we can also add these extra variables. You can use an extra variable to say, that's the ego alter tie, I share a meal with them. And we can do that for share a meal. We can do that for the next one and say, discuss important matter and do that for the next one, you know, went on vacation with and so forth. So we can go back and see here in Architect how that works. Again, the name and so forth. And here are the prompts. Please nominate the people that you've shared a meal with in the last month. And so not only do you have that, but you can assign the additional variable. And we had a variable called share meal and we set it to true. Now I'm going to reproduce this with a um, uh, kind of an, another one. And I would think maybe people you went to a movie with so again, it's still the same set of alters, but we could go, please nominate uh, any, well, anyone you have seen a movie with in the cinema in the last year, probably not in the last three years because there hasn't been a lot of cinema going on. All right, so now just what, look what will happen if I save this. I save this, we're done editing. We can go in and see the prompt, but I want to I want to point something out. We preview this. Okay, if we shared a meal with, I'll just go Alice. See how it uh, see how it doesn't remember the previous one because we were just trying this out. And then anyone you've discussed important matters with, and then we go down here to the next one. Anyone you've seen a movie with in the cinema? Now we can say uh, see a movie with Barb. We have just one problem here now. We've created a new prompt, but we haven't actually assigned the ego alter value. So what would happen is that later on, let's say I want to see, I filter down to just the people who I've been to a movie with. How are we going to know that? Well, that's how we go back and assign that additional variable. Oh, so uh, down here, back to the scene of the movie, assign the variable. And we could say, for example, a new variable to assign. I'm going to I'm going to create a variable, actually. There's a couple different ones here, but let's say we went to scene movie. I'm going to enter. And you can see there it just says A, B, because these, these variables are generally uh, binary. They're, uh, it's like just going to be set to one or the other, and we're going to set it to true. So now later on in the interview, let's say we just want to um, say, what movies did you go to with different people? We can filter down to the people with whom we have a scene movie relationship. Okay. Now, what about alter alter ties? Those are really the place where um, personal network work can be really exciting, but really challenging. Those are the things that we want to represent on the screen. These are the relationships between two people or two nodes that you nominate. Um, and we have a number of ways of doing that. The original one was the sociogram. Um, we included the sociogram uh, because of um, both philosophical and more um, methodological reasons. The philosophical one is we want people to think of this network as a network. We find that it gives a certain level of buy-in, that it, um, when people see it as a network, they kind of think that we're not just extracting data, we're co-constructing constructing an object, and they find that very comforting in many ways. Sometimes people find it just cool. One of the most popular words that's used to describe this is fun. So that's pretty cool and, and fun. <laughs> All right, but now, we, you know, the sociogram has some drawbacks. As you have more nodes on the screen, it gets very dense. It gets very hard to be sure that you're going to um, guarantee every node uh, or every edge between every pair. In one of our prior articles in network science, uh, we looked at how people were entering these longitudinally. We found that there was real consistency, amazing consistency, um, even with adding new people and stuff 
between waves, but sometimes the um, sometimes the edges were a bit um, uneven, uncertain, uh, maybe not consistently uh, entered between waves. For that reason, if you really want to be sure, and you have a network that's large, and what do we mean by large? I'm not sure. Pre-testing might help, but I would go with more than 10 to 15 people. Uh, you would definitely want to consider a dyad census. It's slow and it's tedious, but it gets the job done and you evaluate every single edge pair. You'll notice we also have a way of creating um, alter alter ties using this, what's called a tie strength census. I mean, strictly speaking, it's here's a series of values that you can add. So instead of saying, is a tie there? Yes or no. You can say something like, is a tie really strong? Not so strong, not strong at all. Um, also, uh, you can filter edges and nodes or filter nodes in such a way that maybe you just want to mark some with the dyad census, and then only for those, then go and look and check the tie strength. So you can combine using filters this way of selecting different nodes and edges uh, together to um, thereby minimize burden. We know from past work uh, that individuals are better able to detect closure uh, to those with whom they have more relationships, with have more um, different social contexts. So if you have a network of 30, 40, or 50 people, getting all of the triangles might be really hard. You may want to subset it to just asking within family or within uh, another group. Okay, so now that we have, including alter alter ties, I said, well, what about within family or group? Well, that means we're going to have to know not just nodes and edges, but data about the nodes and edges. We're going to have to include that data in some way or another. And we normally think of that as attributes of, attributes of these objects. Now, I have a list here of some of uh, some common data types that are included in uh, Network Canvas. Now, we don't actually program these in directly. Uh, these are going to, we're going to determine the data type in slightly a different way. Um, later in the next slide, actually, you'll see that we determine the data type by how we want to ask the question. But you don't determine it that way. You probably determine it by, by what question you want to ask. You might want to ask, well, I want to know something, how regular something is, or when the last time was, or you want to know whether somebody is, um, either this or that, or you want to know something about multiple different kinds of things, check all that apply type senses. So these are the data types. Now there's one that I want to uh, just highlight briefly, and that's layout. Layout is a property of um, the nodes as an X and a Y coordinate. Um, goes from uh, uh, zero to one in each direction. So if you went to 0.5 and 0.5, you're, you're at the origin. Uh, and then you can use that later on to kind of reproduce where the nodes are on the screen. Uh, and that can happen pretty seamlessly, in fact, uh, with the data later on. But the other thing is that a layout, it's specific to a node within that layout variable, not to the stage. So you can have a sociogram stage, then go to a different stage. And then when you go to another sociogram stage, you use the same layout, the nodes show up right back where they are. And you can have multiple layouts. If you have different sociograms with uh, maybe one with a picture in the background or one with some circles in the background. So in order to assign that data, we normally map on an input control to the data. Now what's an input control? It's a way we provide input to the, uh, um, to the, to the participant. So and we can see here um, an example of an input control that's kind of a whole stage. And this right here is um, uh, the ordinal bin. So the ordinal bin suggests that we, um, you know, when was the last time you shared a meal? Please drag to the appropriate bin. Now, if you look at this prompt, and it's an ordinal variable. So it's going to have these options like this. Now, you'll notice that when we do an ordinal bin, um, it, uh, it has certain expectations for layout. And so there's some little warnings and caution. It's designed for use for up to five values, for example. Now that ordinal bin might not be what you need. And maybe you wanna collect a lot of data on either ego or alter 
or an alter-alter relationship. You may recall that we mentioned earlier forms. So when you add a form, now we can add a form here, uh, and you can see um, down below, name generator using forms. In fact, if I type form, you'll see that there's per alter form and name generator using form, ego form, uh, and information. I'm going to select a per alter form here, and we can say um, per alter. I'm just going to give it a name. You always have to give it a name. You notice if you don't do that, if you forget, network canvas will give you a little pop-up warning and say, hey, please fill in this data. It normally does that along the way so that you, you don't end up saving a protocol with incomplete information. It, it tends to make it, make it clear. So here we have a person. And uh, we can have an introduction panel, uh, at least for per alters, because we're going to do a per alter form per alter, or one for one alter, one for the next alter, one for the third alter. So we give an introduction screen. I'll just say intro for now. Uh, uh, the, and now we go down to the form, it says here, add one or more fields. So each one of these will be an input control. So the field is gonna have first a variable. So maybe we might say, and you'll notice the variables are, there's already the existing variables. We could use this form to edit an existing variable. So remember earlier we had scene movie and we had share meal. Scene movie came after so what if we want to then think, oh, what if it's dinner and a movie? We wanted to go and, you know, say we also, um, we also had a meal with them. I just didn't think about them at the time. You can include this here and then check it. You can say and just, you know, check, is this the, uh, uh, is this a variable that you wanted? You might say, um, please check that this is accurate. I wouldn't find that particularly friendly, but at least it gets the job done. Done. Now we can say share meal, and it'll include all of the people uh, that we've nominated, including the ones we nominated afterwards. Now you'll notice that in, down at the input control, it's only giving us Boolean choice and toggle. And that's because these are the two input controls that work with this binary variable. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say I'm, uh, I'm going to use Boolean choice. Notice down here that the input control gives you a preview of what it's going to look like to the participant. Now let's go up again. If I say toggle, and you'll see this is what it's like. Boolean is definitely when you want to <clears throat> guarantee that there's a yes or a no value. And Boolean toggle is more like when you want to check something on. So I'm going to go Boolean choice. And we're going to save that. Now at this time, I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to create a new variable. So let's see how that works. So instead we went to a movie <clears throat> and uh, name me the name of the last movie. Uh, name of uh, the last movie scene. Okay, you'll notice here, cannot create variable name, name of last. We want our variable names to be sort of succinct and not have spaces in them. So we might say last movie. And you'll notice down here it has enter. Okay, so I do this. Notice over here it's got a question mark. We've created a variable, but we haven't linked it to anything other than the person. So, so Network Canvas doesn't know what else is that variable is going to be about. So as we follow this down, first is our prompt. Um, please name the last movie you saw together with this person. Sorry, I have to type on my keyboard uh, today. Um, didn't take a, uh, a spare keyboard with me. But now we go down to the input control and see this, it's got a ton of input controls because it doesn't know what kind of data that we wanna collect, but, but we know what kind of data, it's the name of a movie. So that sounds to me like a text input. Okay, so now we do this question prompt. All right, text input, here's the preview. Looks good, we're gonna save this. Now just notice if we go back in there, now you'll see this little text field. It's like that little square with like the cursor in it. It is now assigned that a value. Uh, if you assign the wrong value to that variable, you, you kind of got to delete it and then create a new one. Um, once, we, once we know what kind of variable it is, it, that seems to be, uh, that's it in the program. On the other hand, however, you still can edit the name of the variable. You can edit the wording of it. And I'll show that now in a second. 
see here, we have this per alter form, and that's how we get data about alter. Now, remember I said ego alter ties and alter attributes is a conceptual thing. It, it is, it's, you can get ego alter attributes in here. You can ask, how do you know this person? What is your relationship to them? What is their relationship to you? Those are all on the altar, gonna be stored on the altar. You can also store attributes on an edge as well. It's kind of the same thing, um, except you might have an edge um, form and it'll have person number one and person number two. And then you can say things about the relationship. Uh, you know, for example, are these people um, friends with each other? Do they like each other? When's the last time they met? Um, remember, because it's an indirect tie, it's, you know, your perception of two other people or the respondents, participants' perception of two other people, um, it's worth being mindful of whether they can answer that question. So for example, in sexual contact networks, direct ties where one would have, be having the sexual contact with the people they nominate would be much more reliable than an indirect tie where a person is nominating on, do these people have sex with each other? They would presumably have to disclose that with you or have participated with the participant in that in order for that to be, um, to be that to be available. So bear that in mind with the kind of questions you ask. In Network Canvas, we give a lot of flexibility here to either set the different kinds of nodes, the different kinds of edges, and all of the data you can ask about them. And so then we leave it to you to you know, pre-test this survey, work through it, so that you find a survey that um, can, be, can be tractable for a respondent. I'm going to save those changes, and we're going to move on. Oh, but first, while I'm here, because this might be my last chance, might be my last chance to get through this, I want to show these three buttons up top here. And if you'll notice, they're here, but when we do this, they just kind of emerge up top. They are printable summary, resource library, and codebook. I'll show the resource library now in a minute when we look at whole networks, but uh, the printable summary is a nice sort of PDF way that shows the variables that are used on any given stage, the prompts, and a space for you to write some notes down. Uh, if you're having to submit this to an ethics committee, uh, it might be really appreciated to have like, not like I use Network Canvas, but here is my code book or here's my interview guide. And, um, and the code book can also help us appreciate the, the difference between like the network objects and the network attributes. So here we have it's organized by objects. For ego, we have some variables, colors liked and favorite color. Um, and I show that in an ego form. Um, then we have nodes. First, we have node types, and we only have one node type, which is a person. And that person has these variables or these attributes about them. We can also see where they're used. Now, imagine that we get rid of the stage, the per alter stage. Last movie is still going to be in here. It's just going to say unused. It's not going to remove last movie because it was mentioned on that stage, and the stage is deleted. Last movie as a variable is a property of that particular kind of node. And that particular kind of node is like manifested or shown through different stages, but dependent on any given stage. And we only have one type of node and we don't even have any edges in here yet. Imagine. Oh, I have moved Zoom onto the bottom of my screen and it, that's making it challenging for me to... Uh... <laughs> Here, I'm gonna do this, okay. All right, everyone, unfortunately now I cannot see uh, some faces, but uh, you just let me know in the chat if there's any, uh, uh, if there's anything. All right, great. And uh, I got my time check and we're all good. So I'm gonna save those changes and return to the start screen um, and get back over here. So here we have data comes from an input control to refresh. First, you can get a name, select the input type, and then a variable. <clears throat> now recall that there are both, um, as stated above, ways in which we can have an input type that's a whole stage itself, like our ordinal bin or a categorical bin, but we can also combine some of those in, uh, we can combine some of those into, into a form. And in the form, that's where we can sort of like link them and, and so forth. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to highlight here, we also have, uh, um, it's not quite an input type, this narrative interface, which is where you can display variables 
and attributes and nodes that you've previously nominated in such a way that you can use that as an opportunity to talk with the participant. So maybe on one place you collect data about, you know, did you go for a meal? And the next one is what meals do these people like? Or what cuisines do they like? And so you could have cuisines they like as a check all that apply. And then it'll show up on this narrative interface as maybe these people in pink like one cuisine and these people in blue like a, a different cuisine or are nominated to like a different cuisine or nominated to like that with, uh, with ego. So once again, here we are assigning data. First, we select a stage based on what you're collecting, you know, ego, node, or edge data. You include the type of ego, node, or edge in case you have multiple. You might have persons, maybe concepts, maybe places. You create a variable for that data, select the input control, and the network canvas will assign the variable. Now, once again, we're these can be done per object. And so if you have an ego object, you can have an ego form, an alter object, an alter form, and an edge object is a, you know, an edge form. Or you can do it per network, which is we take um, one kind of input and we do it for everyone in the network. In terms of choosing whether to do it per object or per network, I would recommend that we think about the experience of the participant and how we're priming them. So for example, the reason we created the quick add name generator is because, um, well, people, when you say, who are you discussing important matters with, they're, that's, what they're, that's what they're thinking about in their head. So then if you say, I think about it with Alice, and then they say, okay, now tell me more about Alice. And then you go back, who else discuss important matters with? What you've done is you've kind of interrupted their mind you've interrupted their ability to kind of remember that to go for another task. But on the other hand, if you are trying to assess, say maybe the dimensions of social contact or the dimensions of sexual contact, you might wanna get people reminded of an event or the specific um, uh, experience of a person themselves. And so in which case you might wanna go per alter. Um, and so that leads me to a, just to consider the following questions. It says, maybe because I'm hungry, I'm doing lunch after this. Think of these. How often do you go for a meal with this person? Select some cuisines that you would eat with this person. And to the best of your knowledge, is this person a vegetarian or vegan? Okay, so those might be your questions. But now, thinking back to architect, what are the data types that we're expecting for each of these? What are the input controls which would work for each of these data types? Should these be per network or per alter? I'll give you a, a minute to think about that. The first one, how often do you go for a meal? Well, in social research, we often use ordinal questions of kind of the delayed temporality, maybe um, daily, weekly, monthly. Uh, there's some, you know, challenges to that. Uh, the time series uh, or the, the time use people may say uh, it's most reliable to just ask whether you've been for a meal within a week or not. That's a different question. Uh, but, you know, we would say that's an ordinal one. Select some cuisines that you would eat with this person. That would be a, like a check all that apply. And to the best of your knowledge, is this person a vegetarian or vegan? You might want a binary question to say yes or no, or maybe an ordinal question that is check only one, which is, you know, um, uh, flexitarian, uh, omnivore, vegetarian, etc. cetera. Uh, and that would be different than the prior one because whereas this one is check all that apply, for this one, you might wanna force choice it into a single choice. So in this case, I might argue that this would be a good thing to put in an alter form because these questions are all related. It's all getting you thinking about this one person. Um, you might want to ask the vegetarian one first and then, and then ask the cuisines that go, oh yeah, and then we had this Chinese food and the, they couldn't have anything because it's all filled with fish sauce or, or I, I don't know. Um, and uh, you'll get people um, thinking about, you know, events and stuff and primed on that person. But on the other hand, if you're asking questions, um, say, what is the age of this person? Does this person like movies? Um, what's the last thing you saw from them on Facebook? that might be a bit disorganized and where it might be going per network is better. Okay, so we're kind of near in the end and uh, just some network canvas gotchas, some things we've learned from experience. 
Um, you'll, interestingly, you'll notice I didn't actually show how to create an edge yet, but that's going to come in the last thing I do, which is the whole network example before we, before we break. So first, the network canvas gotchas. And Josh already mentioned some of this, form length and missing data. Another one's that I had mentioned as well as duplicate nodes. And the third is boring interviews. We don't, we want to avoid each of these. So dealing with form length. So if we see this right here in this form, um, we, can, we can add a lot of fields to the form and Network Canvas will keep scrolling. Um, and what happens sometimes is that people may forget there's something at the bottom of the form. Um, so one thing that you can do there is use stage level validation. So if we go down here, um, uh, let's see, to an ego form, an ego form example, we just like here, what's your favorite color? What your favorite color will show up at the bottom right there. Now, if you have lots of stuff, the bottom might be um, too slow, but you'll notice what I did here. You must answer this question before continuing. Now, I personally think that it's good to give people a way to say, don't know, not applicable, can't remember if you make a question mandatory because otherwise you're forcing a choice where there might not even be one, which can lead to um, what has been established as um, choice blindness. Um, and we don't want that, but um, uh, that's where people will, will make a choice because they weren't really sure ahead of time. Uh, yeah, and uh, okay, just a sec, I had, uh, um, uh, am I got, uh, do I have two minutes or do I have seven minutes? Because uh, I'm getting some conflicting uh, data here. Kate, uh, you wanna, do you wanna get that in? Uh, in the, uh, okay, great, thank you very much. Um, all right, so how did I do that? The stage level validation shows up right at the bottom. And you'll see here that I said that it was required. And that way we can kind of manage so that people don't miss the bottom of a form. But really you probably shouldn't have a form that's longer than the page to begin with. And to that end, I think it's best to break up these things into multiple different forms. Okay, the next one, um, duplicate nodes. I already mentioned that we can use side panels in order to drag the nodes in, just try to avoid um, making it so that people forget that they've already nominated. Uh, so I just want to highlight that here, but I think we already showed that with respect to the side panels above. And boring interviews, try to keep it fresh. Use the fact that variables are passed around in order to break up the interview. You, know, you can have a layout, an ordinal bin, and then a layout. Um, and that way you can kind of keep it um, a bit exciting rather than being very boring. <clears throat> now, finally, for the last five minutes, I want to show this roster example. Rosters were commonly requested before we had them, and they're a really useful way in which we can um, get data in the interview. Now they have one, they have a couple constraints. Um, one constraint is that they have to be pre-done before the interview. Uh, and so you have to upload that into Network Canvas Architect, not into Interviewer. So that means per protocol, you only get one roster. Now, this is what I wanted to show here, the whole network demo. And uh, so within that demo, uh, we can see here, I've got a couple different things here. I've got nominee ego and alter prompts as two separate stages. You'll notice that I have in this resource library, I have the whole class list redacted. So this is what I did with my class, but here it's just A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's not um, any names. Um, and so let's see, that's our, that's the only resource that we have in there. Now I could have uploaded there or in the, uh, in the roster generator. And you'll notice here we have a different type. It's not a person anymore. It's a student. The data source, which is whole class list redacted. Now let's say I want to change that in some way. I can update that resource. Well, how do I change it? Um, if we go back to the resource library, you'll notice that it has a little download button there. So we can actually download that and then edit it and then upload it back again. Get that out of there. Now, if we have a whole network, we don't necessarily want people linking to themselves. Maybe we do or don't, but I normally don't. And so what we would have I first is one stage where we nominate ego. Um, and I'm gonna go down here right to the bottom. These are all some um, configuration options for how you present the data but I wanna show here the prompt. 
please select only yourself. And then I also wanna show minimum and maximum number of alters. So I have one maximum alter. If I try to add a second alter as myself, it's gonna say no. And if you might be remember uh, from earlier, here we add an additional variable called is ego. So I'm gonna use that then later on and set it to true, right? Now then once we have ego nominated, we can have some alter prompts. And we can have alter prompts, things like, please select the people you knew before coming to class, the ones you've met since class. You can kind of reorganize those around in different ways or have them on different stages. Um, but the way I've done this is we can add them in two separate prompts. I don't have any minimum or maximum number of alters. Um, and you'll notice that because of the way the roster works, it, it excludes ego. Um, and then finally, this layout right here, this is where I wanted to show uh, the network, uh, how we would uh, assign uh, edges. <clears throat> You'll notice it has a little filter here because I don't put ego on here. The filter is where student is ego is not true. So now we're gonna lay out everybody except ego. Now watch this right here. We've got nobody in there, but we, if I go right up to the top here, Please select only yourself, I'll be A. Now this one doesn't show A. We can drop these in right here. Please select the ones you knew before coming to class. The next prompt, please select the nose since class. It only includes those that are available. Now watch down here, A is not available, but the rest of them are, and we can do things uh, with them. Now I haven't assigned or set any edges in this, we won't really have much time for that, for the alter, alter edges. But that itself is um, something that you can do within, uh, uh, within these sorts of layouts right here. Uh, if you'll notice, layout mode, manual, automatic, prompts, and there we can create uh, some edges. Normally we don't necessarily want to create edges for everybody in the whole network. That's kind of a cognitive social structure. We normally want egos relationship to other alters and then we combine that later. That would require you using multiple data and using multiple um, files and stitching them together. That's something that's gonna be shown after the break. So now uh, not really much left, just some potpourri. You can do stage level filtering. There's also skip flow logic and I didn't get to really show narrative mode, but I think it's fabulous. So that's pretty much it for my time for Architect. Uh, I hope that was helpful. And uh, yeah, enjoy the break. I hope I didn't make you too hungry. Hey folks. Um, the next um, part of our workshop, we're gonna be now talking about using Network Canvas data and data export. And Pat's gonna take that over. Pat, you ready? Yep. Cool. All right. Hi everyone, I'm Pat Janoulis. I'm an assistant professor at Northwestern here in Chicago with the rest of the Chicago folks. I'm gonna share my screen. I'll probably have the kind of shortest uh, session uh, here, but as Michelle mentioned, I'm going to uh, be going over the data expert process. As lots of folks have talked about, we're really focusing on uh, you know, directly exporting data from interviewer today. There's a separate process that can be used if you're using the server app. Um, but it's actually quite uh, self-explanatory, hopefully, um, due to Josh's uh, design. And basically, it kind of brings you through step-by-step step in a wizard. So as you can see here, uh, I'm in the interviewer. I'm just scrolling down to manage, ex manage and export uh, session data. So this is actually data. Josh mentioned the developer tool um, that kind of creates dummy data for you. Um, this is an example of that. So uh, you can actually, you can either find this on the Google Drive um, or you can create your own data if you, uh, you know, develop a protocol and go through this process. So, you know, within that managing the and data export, um, you see these little cards representing each of the uh, interviews that you conducted, or in this case, the fake interviews that were um, produced through the developer tools. Um, and you can either select individual uh, observations here or interviews. Um, or there's these, you know, tools at the bottom that can, for example, select all the uh, cases that you haven't exported yet, um, or all in, in that case, or, you know, the ones that you have already exported, if you're looking to basically re-download your data. After you select which um, sessions that you want to export, you just go uh, export selected files. And here we have a series of options. 
basically through this kind of wizard process of data export. As Josh mentioned, there's really two main formats that the, uh, the software exports. One is a GraphML file. Um, and that's basically a, uh, you know, it's an XML based uh, file format that's specifically designed for network or graph uh, data. Um, it's a, it's uh, in many ways, it's better because it's a single file that contains all the information uh, from a, a single uh, observation or a single interview. Um, but perhaps the more common format is in these uh, CSV files, which many people are used to handling in traditional kind of flat formats. Um, and by uh, default, uh, it's essentially going to give you three files um, for each uh, interview, depending on what type of data you, you have, but um, I'll go through the specific uh, files in a moment. Um, you can, it, for, so three files for each interview. You can merge those sessions into basically a uh, combined file, so instead of three files for each interview, you would get three files overall. Um, and so it's multiple egos and the ego file, for example, and uh, uh, alters uh, all the alters across interviews in a single alter file. Um, I'm gonna uh, use the kind of default format that people may be more uh, familiar with in using prior software. Um, and I'll, I'll talk uh, basically in the R code that I'm gonna show that works with this data, it kind of combines those files for you. Um, you can basically skip that step if you use the merge session. Um, and then the final one is really just a, uh, a setting for how the coordinates for these sociogram layouts are uh, presented in the uh, data file. Um, and uh, Josh can speak more to that really, but uh, it, you know, it's probably a more kind of niche feature that uh, not everyone uh, will uh, you know, be interested in unless you're specifically uh, focusing on those layouts. So you know, I'm just gonna keep these defaults where we're exporting a graph ML and we're exporting the CSV files. Um, and it's you know, quite simple, you just click this and then you get a little uh, counter and then you can assign where it is. So uh, like I said, all these files are um, going to be up on, uh, on our Google Drive, the, these exact files that I'm working with, as well as the R script that I'm going to be using. But before we get into that, um, let's look at the actual file format. So uh, we'll start with a, the Ego um, uh, data set. So like I said, this is just for one interview, for, so for a single participant, basically. And in this case, it makes sense. So the Ego file really just has one row. Um, you know, two rows if you count the variable names. Um, but you can see things that you might expect to see. You're going to see a lot of these very long string, uh, uh, combined strings. And basically, those are designed just so they're unique. Um, so there's some randomization added to them, and they're long, so we don't get duplicates across different interviews or across the different alters. So you see things like an ego ID that's going to kind of help you, uh, you know, know which alters belong to which ego or which edges belong to which ego. Um, and then you get uh, the case ID, which is the, the information that you actually type in when you start an interview. Um, and then you get some other kind of uh, interview level information, like when the session, the session started, when it uh, finished, when you exported, um, and then any other ego level information that you collected during the interview itself. We can then go to the alter uh, information here. And similarly, you're gonna see you know, this ego ID, which helps us identify whose alters these are. Uh, you get the alter IDs in this case, um, and then all the information that you collected. Uh, as, you know, as you can notice again, these kind of long uh, combined strings. Um, and then we also have a node ID, which is not unique across alters. So the, you know, the network canvas UDU ID here is going to be unique across the different interviews. Um, so you, know, you shouldn't have duplicates. Uh, but you know, it's often very challenging to look at or uh, handle if you're ever looking at the data itself. So you can, as a quick and easy way within a single uh, you know, egos interview, you can look at these node IDs. And I use them a little later in the visualization just to show um, some of that. So we have the ego information, we have their alters information, and then obviously we will have edge information. Um, in this case, we only have a single type of uh, edge. So we just have one here. Um, again, we have these like simplified uh, versions of things. So an edge ID uh, from and a two that are not going to be unique across uh, 
you know, the different interviews, but we also have these uh, long versions. So again, here we have the ego ID to identify that when we're importing this data into R or whatever software you're using, um, we know that whose interview this data came from. We have an edge ID that's a long form here. And then we have the source and target, which are going to be what connects to our alter uh, data files. Um, and again, in the R script, that's how we kind of identify where these edges are going. Um, and we know that they're going to be uh, unique across the different interviews. So we can just, you know, definitively identify uh, who these connections should be uh, between. That's just a, you know, a crash course in how the data is going to typically come out um, in the CSV files. And uh, th those are the files uh, that I'm going to be working with here in R. Um, so this is just a, you know, a, basically in our notebook uh, that the, uh, again, this is on the Google Drive. Um, and it's working with these uh, specific files that I also included in the Google Drive. Um, a lot of it, there's a lot of text that I'm not going to read, obviously, but you can look at it. Um, and there's, I think, I think I uploaded the HTML version if you, if it's much prettier than, uh, you know, you open it in the actual, uh, our studio here. Um, but what we're doing, just, you know, setting a folder here. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, because we didn't merge the sessions and we're basically using separate files for each interview, um, where this is just a, uh, you know, quick and easy uh, using some, uh, some code to basically uh, loop through the files in this folder to combine them into um, a singer, single uh, data frame for the alter data, a single data frame for the edgeless data, and then a single data frame for the ego uh, data, which uh, a lot of the stuff we're doing here is uh, associated with the ego R package. And this is basically the same, you know, purposely, but this is basically the same format which uh, that package likes to use this information uh, to, uh, you know, just handle uh, ego data. Just to check to make sure we got the data that we want. Um, this is, you know, basically the same thing that we were seeing before. So that looks good. Um, this uh, section here is just some simple recoding, basically taking it, uh, these non, uh, you know, you know, using text instead of the uh, codes that we actually included in Network Canvas. Uh, and then here uh, is how the kind of the essential component in bringing this data into the ego R package, um, again, defining, you know, the alter, the ego, and the edge list information. And then we define the, you know, these unique identifiers that can be, that are used in Network Canvas that we can use to identify basically, you know, the, the those information that I was saying, the ego, uh, and then the alters. Um, for the edges as well. So uh, again, here's a little bit of recoding, and then we're just going to plot one of the uh, ego networks to see, make sure you know we have kind of what we should have, and it, uh, things make sense. Um, adding some color here just to make it clear, and uh, a little overlap in the uh, names here, but yeah, basically you know this looks like a pretty dense ego net. Um, uh, I, you know, like I said, this is kind of randomly generated, so um, it's not very meaningful, but um, nonetheless, we see what we kind of expect to see in an ego net. So that's just plotting a single ego net. You can obviously um, do many other things. The uh, ego R package has some specific visualizations that let you look at things, for example, across different uh, ego nets. In this case, here we have. In this case, I'm using the node IDs rather than the node, uh, the kind of the labels or the names, just for because it's really in, uh, difficult to see. Um, and this is really visualized in multiple things. So in this case, we're um, seeing the inside or outside is identifying the uh, if they're a family member, and then the quadrant in the, which the uh, nodes, the alters are placed, identifies kind of the frequency of communication. This is just an example of you know some of the tools that are in EOR that you can uh, use to visualize things. There's no particular meaning, but um, just to show that you know these are four distinct ego nets, and we can get data. We're getting this data out of network canvas. Obviously, there's other things you want to do with uh, network data. You just don't want to, it's not just visualizations. Um, you know, and there's other functions here. So you can provide a summary of information on the uh, ego networks. So in this case, you know, we get things like the minimum, the maximum size of each ego net, uh, or the, all, all the ego nets, the average size, um, and so on and so forth, density, things like that. And then we can get the, uh, you know, aggregate that into a uh, data frame. In this case, the ego, these are the, you know, each observation and the density of their egocentric network. Finally, you know, what we usually want to do is not just get summary statistics, but um, hopefully look at some 
uh, you know, some relationships between, for example, maybe summary statistics and some other stuff. Um, so this is just the uh, histogram of the degree um, for across the different ego nets uh, or uh, the alters in this case. Um, and then finally, uh, we have here is just plotting each ego net. Uh, and you know, in this case, maybe there's some relationship between the uh, egocentric network density and how much they enjoy uh, visiting conferences. Um, and maybe we see a, a slight negative uh, association here. Um, but nonetheless, you know, overall, this is just really, these are obviously very toy, silly examples. Um, uh, but just to show that, you know, how you bring in uh, network data from Network Canvas um, and some examples of very simple uh, and oversimplified, perhaps, uh, examples of data analysis that you could be uh, conducted. Um, you know, happy to answer any questions about this. The, I guess it's important to note there isn't, and this is well overdue, but there isn't an example yet of um, you know using GraphML uh, or using the merged data sets. That would basically only change this part. Um, and there, there are uh, functions, um, although it's a little more challenging. You have to work across packages usually, um, but you can uh, you know use all the either format um, to bring this data in and use it with any of the packages that you use. It just uh, it's just basic data manipulation that you have to handle. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll have some more examples uh, that are a little bit more generalizable uh, on you know, our documentation soon. We're about at the end of our time. Um, thanks for, for bearing with us um, for a three hour Zoom. I know that's never fun, but you know, we hope that this was useful for you and a way for you to um, yeah, get some orientation to Network Canvas. Um, we are going to be sending out uh, an evaluation link to you all. Um, Kate just posted it in the chat. Um, please let us know, you know, how, how this went, suggestions for improvement. Um, this is a different format for us in terms of usually we take a little bit more time. This is a little bit shorter. How did it go? Um, and are there areas that you think we should focus more on, less on, any tips? We'd love to hear all of that um, in addition to feedback on software and functionality. Um, please also, you know, reach out to us if you have any questions, um, things that come up in the meantime, um, you know, info at networkcanvas.com um, um, and all of the other ways that you can reach out to us. Um,